This is Tremaine Stevens, former NFL running back, former San Diego Charger, former Indianapolis Colts. Now I'm the owner of Athletic Development Systems, and I stay rocking with Grand Dossier TV. with Tremaine Stevens. What we're going to talk about today, his journey through the NFL, his journey of being recruited from his hometown of Grizz, South Carolina. But before we get into that story, make sure you go on and hit the subscribe button, like it, share it, hit the notification bell so when we go live with all our new stories on Sundays, you will be up to date with them. So, Tremaine, how you doing today, man? Man, I'm feeling great, man. I I'm, I'm, uh, just got my workout in. Feeling, feeling amazing, feel like a million bucks, man. I feel good. So today we want to talk about you with your journey to the NFL, what led to that. Um, I was doing some research on you here. For, I'll see that you're from Chris, South Carolina. That's right there between what, Spottenburg, Gaffney area. Gaffney area, you're right, exactly. Big exactly. football city. Of course, of so, course. In your journey of that, before we get to the high school days, what that got you started into athletics, into working out, into playing football? Well, what kind of got me started was uh, really my father. He uh, played college football um, up in South Carolina State, played for the Mighty Mighty Bulldogs right there in Orangeburg, South Carolina. And so he kind of got me started. We would go down to Orangeburg every single home game. We would watching games. Every single Sunday we would watch football. So my dad was the one that kind of got me and my brother and stuff started in this thing, man. It was a journey that just really took place over time, but you know, him kind of just letting us know that if we wanted to make it, we could. He had a chance to actually go pros. He got drafted to uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, but unfortunately at that same year, he got drafted to the war, um, to the Vietnam War. And so he wasn't able, obviously that took a precedence over him going, but you know, that kind of told me that maybe I had something that was inside of me that I could possibly pull out to kind of take me to that next level too. So football is a family thing. It is so, a family thing. So do y'all play the same position? Was y'all different? What was y'all skill sets like? Well, my dad was a defensive end, so he was totally different. My brother played linebacker, so he was more kind of geared to what my dad was doing. Me being a running back kind of came out of, uh, you know, I wanted to play defense. I didn't really like to hit that much. And I realized that when you score touchdowns, girls like you. So I said, you know what? Let's go offense. So you you chose sexy over being tough. <laughs> hey, I feel you. I understand. I did, man. I'm not gonna lie. I did. <laughs> I don't. I don't blame you at all. Cause like you say, sometimes, man, giving the hit, sometimes it'll be a lot tougher than dodging the hit. Right, so than I, dodging the so hit. So I yes, understand. Sir. Yes, sir. So between, so with you getting started with your dad showing you the ropes of football, you go to junior high school. When you're the man on the team, I take it. Right. Right. You go to high school. What was that like? Well, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit of a of a backdrop into this thing. So <clears throat> I was always that kid who loved to like be out there and be truly outgoing. But I was also a kid who stuttered a whole lot. So I really wanted to play quarterback. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play quarterback. However, have you ever seen a stuttering quarterback? No. Right. You out there trying to call plays, you trying to get the words out. And then it's it's um, a delayed game because you don't you can't even get to say uh, you can't even get the words out. You know <laughs> now you got to find. So that's when so that's what really got me started in a running back style of things. And then you know I was always a kid who was fast. You know a lot of kids are fast, but I had an extra gear that most kids just did not have. And my middle school coaches they noticed that. My high school coaches they noticed that. As a matter of fact, my high school coaches. Um, actually came to my middle school games. <clears throat> and so they knew that when I got to high school that I was going to automatically probably be on varsity. So that kind of helped me to kind of get the ball rolling. And just a quick story in that, man, I was literally, as a freshman, I was on varsity. I had two running backs that were in front of me. Um, the first running back, first game, ACL, gone. 
So I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm cool because I'm still one down. Now, granted, I'm a 14-year-old, 130-pound freshman. So I'm not quite the guy that you see before you today. So it's a little bit different. Um, very next nice game, so the backup, he finishes that game. The very next nice game, right about second, second quarter or so, next guy tears his ACL. Mm, that's so that's now that's depth, so lost for the season. So now this 130-pound freshman has to come in against these seniors and stuff like that. And I wound up rushing for, you know, over my last nine games, wound up rushing for about 830 yards. And from then, I never gave up that spot. So, you know, it's one of those things, man, where I was kind of forced into it. But through what my dad taught me and through what, you know, I had gone through with my brother and us kind of working out in the backyard and my dad, you know, kind of telling me how tough that it was for college and getting me mentally ready and prepared, I was able to step into my role and perform in the way that I did. Now, with having your dad as your, um, I hate to say the word cheerleader, but as your dad as your trainer, your cheerleader, your, right. your biggest role model probably right. at the time. I know you said it helped you, but did that separate a lot of things for you with him having that college experience? Was that a big separation and gap over the other guys? It really, really was. And it was in like really three facets. One, it gave me an inside look into not only what I need to be doing at my high school level, but what I need to be showing college coaches when I'm out there on the field. It's more than just in the game. He kind of taught me that, listen, when you're – off on the sideline, coaches want to see, are you a guy that when he makes a bad play, puts his helmet on his head and sulks and just doesn't want anybody around him? Or is he still a guy to try to get, you know, everybody pumped up? Um, two, it gave me an insight into, you know, how I wanted to approach this game of football, how I wanted to play every play till this last play, go as hard as I possibly can. And then three, the mental part of it, not just knowing what I'm doing on the field, but studying my opponent, this was during the time when we didn't really have meetings for like, you know, um, right, right, exactly. Like we would kind of know who was, but I studied film before my teams were studying film. So when it came up, I knew that this free safety, if he crept down and that strong safety stepped back, I would have a chance to break to this side because that free safety likes, likes to come inside of his middle linebacker. I knew that if I could just get him and set him up and break, I could take that. So all three facets, you know, of that game, he helped me to really get get to really get there for myself. So not only chili but a mentor. I think that's like the ultimate cheat code for a student to have at that time, which oh, is God. a great thing. Uh, because there's a lot of kids now, man, they just run. Right. They don't know to cut back, they don't know how to do this, they don't know how to study. Right. Studying is not something people know how to do. It's not. It's an art within itself uh when it comes to football. So with you having that, that's an amazing tool. And I know your coach is probably just was excited Love to it. have you right there. Because at the time you played, uh, what year was that? So that was uh, from 91 to 94 were my high school years. And at that time, ACL injuries were, were devastating. If you had a ACL injury, you were done for at least a good, a good year and a half. Now it's, you know, anywhere from six to eight months and you're back and you're fully healthy. Not then. They didn't have quite the technology and stuff that they have now. So, yeah, it was a devastating injury. So I knew that. Good gracious, if these guys, and these were these are big backs, like these are juniors and seniors. So these are guys who were, you know, to me big, 180, you know, 190, big boys. I'm like, man, if they do that, then what's gonna but again, I was able to get in there and mentally know that I was ready for it. So that was your freshman year, you said. Freshman year, yeah. So we go past sophomore year. What year did the letter start coming in for you from colleges? So my sophomore year, um, I later stayed in Russia. So after my sophomore year, the summer between my sophomore and my junior year is when letters started coming. And to this day, I will never, ever forget my very first letter that came in the mail. You know, I was getting some small time letters, stuff like that. But my very first letter, and this kind of goes to the point of, you know, you never forget who your first was, right? <clears throat> my first letter came from NC State. And... Um, it was Coach Porti, who was the running backs coach at the time, handwritten letter. I still got it at my house. Um, and he basically said, I see how you're playing. I love the way you're doing, blah, 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 blah. I, we would love to have you in NC State. Just keep grinding, keep doing. That letter 
to me meant everything. And then from there, I just started getting letter after letter after letter. And then this was during a time when there wasn't any YouTube or any huddle or anything like that. So coaches had to physically come to your game. And I'll never forget my first game, uh, my junior year, my first game. Um, I'm out there and I'm playing. And I look up in the stands and I see Coach Phil Fulmer, who was the head coach up at Tennessee. And I see him in the stands. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is, this is you know, this is real. Um, my first offer came from NC State. Um, I wound up, after all was said and done, I wound up with 42 D1 offers. I had a couple of, of, uh, of smaller school offers, but 42 D1 offers. My greatest call that I got, and I could kill my brother to this day, the greatest call that I got, Lou Holtz from Notre Dame called and left a message. And my brother heard it. I was still in school. Um, for some reason, he was home for something. My mom picked him up or something. He was checking um, um, the voice recorder for the, for the phone and heard it. And when, and when I, I walked in the house, I was like, oh, my God, Tremaine, Tremaine, Tremaine. It's Coach Lou Holtz, Lou Holtz. I'm like, what, 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 what? I go in there. I go to listen to it. And it's been deleted. So I never heard the Lou Holtz. I never, but I wanted to kill my brother that time. So that was that. That was like my greatest, greatest moment, man. But it was, it was a fun process, man. Because at that time, that, okay, you said '91. I guess Jerome Bettis just left. Around Jerome that time Bettis had just out. had just left. That was the time of um. It was Ricky Waters, mm -hmm. um, 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 and then my dad is actually from Woodruff, South Carolina, which is where. Tony Rice is from. Okay. So we followed Tony Rice when they won the national championship. They came back to Woodruff, which is a small town in South Carolina. They came back to Woodruff and we went to the doggone big parade that they had for them. And I was like, is this what it like to be to go to Notre Dame? You get parades and stuff at your hometown? So, and Notre Dame was kind of big for me. My brother really loved Notre Dame, but you know, that was one of those national powerhouses where they just had rich and great tradition and all that stuff. So, um, I loved it. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie, I did. So what was your decision come senior year? What was the decision for you to say, you know what, I got to go to NC State? Because one would say if you go to Notre Dame, things would have been a lot bigger, right. a lot more grand. Right. So what was that decision to say, you know what, I'm going to forego wearing the gold helmet? Because right. Rudy, for me, made me love Notre Dame Right, as well. right, of course, of course. So what made you say, ah, you know, I'm not going to do it. Right. I'm going to go to NC State. So, and I think that most, most kids need to kind of think of this. This is your process. This is your, this is what's going to help to benefit you. Yes, you want to go to a great school that's rich and all kinds, but when it comes down to it, you want to go to a school that's going to fit you from an academic standpoint, that's going to fit you from a social standpoint, and then that's going to fit you also from an athletic standpoint. My five schools that I took my visits for were, my five that I nutted down to were, it was Florida State, it was Georgia, it was Notre Dame, it was Clemson, and it was NC State. So those were my five schools that I nutted down to. I went on visits to all five schools. When I went to Notre Dame, it was so cold. We went at the wrong time. I said, I can't, bro, this is, I'm from Greer, South Carolina, this ain't, um, but everywhere that I went, you know what I'm saying, they had established backs. Gotcha. And they had guys like up at Georgia, it was um it was Garrison Hurst, and then it was it was uh um a guy who played for the page. I can't think of his name right now. Um at Florida State, it was um the little bitty, oh my gosh, little bitty sh short running back that had a great career, played for the Buccaneers as oh, well. War Dunn, it was Ward Dunn. He was just a sophomore at the time, you know. And so I chose NC State because, and no offense to the backs that were there, but I felt as though, you know, that was going to be my greatest chance to get on the field as quickly as possible, and it wound up being so. Now, what was your recruitment like when you went on these things? Well, you know, was coaches oh, man. giving you the red carpet? Oh, like, man. what was it like for, for, for the viewers and, the, you know, the kids that would see this who think about you know, being Right. What was that process like for you? Man, it was it was it was the grandest because when I came out of high school, I was I was a number two running back in the country. Oh. 
So, so, so when, so when I tell you that places that I went to Tennessee, um, and I'm looking at 101,000 seats up there, and then I'm walking out on the field with my parents and my brother, and on um, the loudspeakers got and starting at running back for Tennessee volunteers Tremaine Steve, and it's got a montage of like my college thing up on this big screen. Everywhere that I went, you know, it was a red carpet treatment. Um, they were trying to get you there. They were trying to show you the highlights. Um, what my father told me, and I think one of the reasons why it's good to have a mentor, it's good to have a person who has a level head. He said, Tremaine, it doesn't matter about all this stuff. What it comes down to is that they're showing you the best. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to decipher what the real is. Right. Like Tremaine, you walking out there and you being the only person on that field and them saying, they started again, that's not the real. That's to get you there. And when I found out, even, even at NC State, rolled out the red carpet, eating, wine and dining, going out, you know what I'm saying? Even when I went on my visit, you know what I'm saying? I had a great, a great guy who took me out to places and, and all that stuff. But when it came down to it, that ain't gonna help you when them 6 a.m. morning runs. And them coaches, they, they, once they get you, right. now you're theirs. It's different. it's different. Now it's get on the line, you, we got more. Than, no more of that wine and dine. So I need these guys to realize, like, sift through all of the glitz and glamour and find the real. Now, you said 6 a.m. morning runs. First oh, of all, wow. when you told me this interview was going to be at 8 o'clock, I struggled. You said, I'm over here drinking coffee. <laughs> so how was that? I mean, for people in high school right. who don't understand that right. process, because, you know, their talent is, oh, man, I'm, I'm great. You was number two. Right. Know? So... How did that like go with you to be like, man, 6 a.m.? What, what is this about? What is different between that college uh, preparation from I was the man in Pop Warner, I was the man in junior high school, I'm the man in high school now? It's like, wow, wow, 6 a.m. Right. Well, I need you to realize, too, that every single guy that's out there on that field with you, mm -hmm. they were the man at their spots. You know what I'm saying? So, like, every single guy that's in college, they were the guy at their high school. So now you're around a whole bunch of guys who are the guy, right? And so the one thing that really helped me to separate was I already knew what this was because I had a father who had gone through that. So for those who don't have that, you know, hopefully they get a chance to see this. You got to realize it's not just like the gift is the 12 to 13 games on Saturday. Mm -hmm. That's the gift. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, the, that's the gym, that's the creme de la creme, right? When people talk about the grind, the grind is waking up at 5.15 to go to a 6 a.m. workout that lasts till 7, where guys are throwing up, guys are passing out, guys are dying, then having to get into the training room, having time spent in there to try to get over whatever aches and pains Mind you, you have an 8 o'clock class. You go from 8 till about 12 or 1 o'clock, whatever. Get a little bit of lunch, whatever. Then you got meetings from 2 to 3. Mm -hmm. Then you got practice from 3 to 6. Mm -hmm. Then you got study hall from 7 to 8. Mm -hmm. Then your whole day starts over again. Mm -hmm. That's the grind. That's the mental grind. So when you see the kids on Saturday, that's our playground. Right. Like that's our time away. But don't think that all of that glitz and glamour, all that goodness happens just because I'm good. No, I, 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 I had to grind for this. So when you're being recruited, when you're going through all this process, realize you're going to have some tough days. Like there's been many days where I hit that alarm at 5, 15 a.m. and I go, <laughs> is it worth it? Right. Do I, do I really like this? I'm going to get beat up today. Is it worth it? It's up to you to make that decision. So as a freshman, you come in, you learn about this new process for you. You're a sophomore now. You're a junior now. Right. What were some of the pitfalls that you would tell your underclassmen? Or what some of the pitfalls we can say over here today? This is what you should avoid doing. Like, you got to study your playbook. You know, a lot of people think, hey, man, I'm good. I don't right. have no playbook. Right. I'm open all day. I'm 7-Eleven. Right, 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 right. So what's some pitfalls we can avoid? <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. Every, every, every single great player that you – watch that you follow, you know, 
for you guys at home, every, every single great player that you see, they're talented. But every single one of them, they are students and studiers of the game. I don't care, your talent will only take you so far because everybody has talent. When you get to a certain level, everybody has that. What separates the Tom Brady's and the Russell Wilson's and those guys is that like they take their studying to a whole nother level. So if I will say anything like learn from the guys that have been there, mm -hmm. learn from your coach, listen. If you go in there with a mentality of I know everything that I need to know, you will not make it, gotcha. plain and simple. So when you go in there as a freshman, learn as much as you possibly can. You might get a chance to play, you might not. That never stops your learning. The more that you learn, the more that when you get ready to play, you'll be ready. So is, so is being red shirted a good or bad thing for some people? I think it's a good thing. Um, I technically was not red shirted, but again, my preparation that I had prepared me to when that time came, and a quick story about that, um, I came in as a freshman, very first practice. I'm fourth, fifth on the depth chart. So I'm running with like the fifth string team, okay? So the fifth string team is a team that's gonna show um, the looks for first team defense. And we had a couple of all conference guys and stuff at defensive end, at linebacker. So here comes my makeshift freshman line with my freshman quarterback fresh against juniors and seniors and guys who've been there forever. And um, scrimmage, right? So first play, pitch, toss. Our vor tacklers, I take it like 80-some yards. Mm, okay. Now, at this point in time, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, right? But I'm like, their defensive coordinator says, we can't tackle this skinny 160-pound freshman running again, same play. Stevens, get back in there. What? They know what's coming. They know what's coming, coach. I promise to God, my teammates will probably see this. Same play, same exact result. Mm. They knew it was coming. But, 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 gone. 80 yards, touchdown. That's when I kind of knew, okay, I can play at this level. That's when the coaches knew, hey, maybe we have something special. But the reason why is because even, even in the spring game before I got there, my senior year, I was watching their spring game and I was, I was up there taking notes. Gotcha. So I knew what, so I kind of knew. So again, that learning process, but back to being redshirted, I think it's a good thing if you're not mentally ready. Gotcha. Physically is one thing, mentally is totally another. If you go into a game and have a bad game, are you able to bounce back? If you're not, you probably need to be redshirted, gotcha. yeah. So as you, because uh, you left as a junior or a senior? I left as a senior. I had a chance to leave as a junior, um, but, but I wound up, but I wanted to leave as a senior. Yeah, I came in senior. What was the pause? Why did you wait? Um, the junior year class of running backs had a lot of top-notch running backs that were coming out. Um, I felt as though if I, if I had a really good year as a senior, that would kind of help to up, up my draft status. So I kind of waited. So not only is going to college a mental and a physical aspect of it, but listening to you talk, it seems like it's a business aspect to it as well. Once you get to that level of you have a desire to play at that next level, you have to start making these decisions that will affect you, you know, over, over the course of your career. So of course, yeah, it's mental, it's physical, it's emotional, it's social, but when it comes down to it, that next level that you're trying to get to, that is a business. And they don't really care about if you have bills to pay or, you know, if, you're, if your daughter's sick, they, right. listen, I need you to perform on Sunday. So yeah, you gotta start to get that mental aspect of it, even while you're junior and senior in college, if you know that that's what you wanna do. What's the most uh, memorable game and at NC State that you had that you know it's the game you're going to talk about for the rest of your life to everybody you come in contact with? So I got two games. I guess one is most memorable to NC State fans mm -hmm. that every time that I run into one, they tell me about this. And then one that is most memorable to me. So the one that's most memorable to fans is my freshman year, we were playing against Virginia and they were nationally ranked. They were, they were, they were 11th or 12th 
and their defense was first. So they were first in the country, um, hadn't allowed a 100-yard rusher all season long. Um, and we were down by about four. We had a minute, 36 seconds left, and they called a draw play for me. We were on our own 16-yard line. Um, they had Virginia slated to go to a big time bowl, Orange Bowl, something like that maybe. Um, I took that ball, I took it 84 yards, gone. NC State fans to this day, and that's been, that was 1994. To this day, they, that, that was their most memorable moment of uh, some of them of their state career. Um, that sent them to the Poulon Weed Eater Bowl and we, and we wound up going to the Peach Bowl um, against Mississippi State. And then the one that's most memorable to me is versus East Carolina. Um, we were down with about maybe less than a minute left. We had the ball on the two-yard line, and I, I took it over the top, and I scored. And that, and that helped to beat our in-state rival, East Carolina, at home, last game of the year, last game as a senior. Um, just really happy that the coach, you know what I'm saying, allowed me to be – be the one that was able to kind of seal the deal for us. He had he had that confidence to me. So those two games were the most memorable. Now as we leave NC State, mm -hmm. we get prepared for the for the creme of a creme. Yeah, creme the big time. Right. Big time. Big time. Was knocking at the door. Right. Did we have a draft party? We did. We did. And it wasn't what I thought it would be. Oh, explain. And I'll tell you why. Um, so every 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 publication had me slated, slated to go between, you know, somewhere between third, third and fifth round. Um, my senior year, I led the conference in rushing. I was 10th in the nation in rushing. Um, I had a really, really good year. Um, and during the course of the draft, as it was going on, I saw guys being drafted that kind of felt as though, man, I had a better year. I don't, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a better player, but I had a better season. Um, went to the combine, did well, ran a good 40, still owned the highest vertical for a running back ever who has ever gone, gone to the combine. Um, and so, you know, I felt as though I did the right things and the whole draft went through. Third round came and went, fourth round came and went, fifth, I got 30, 35 family members at the house. Fifth round, sixth, seventh, didn't get drafted. Oh, man. So, um, as soon as the draft was over, I got a, a bunch of phone calls from some free agent teams, talked to my agent. We chose that, like, the team that was best fit for us were the Chargers. But again, you know, I wanted to be that, and with the so-and-so pick, the so-and-so, mm -hmm. and that didn't happen. But, you know, as I look back on it, I kind of got a chance to pick my own team, which I kind of felt as though it gave me the best chance. But... I would have loved to have been drafted, drafted. So that was a disappointment at that time. But now that I look, look, uh, look back on it, it was, it, was, it was probably the best fit because there were guys who were drafted that didn't make it through preseason. So, so you know, it, it, was, it was good. And what team did you get drafted to? So I went to the San Diego Chargers. So, yep, so I was, I was, I was at the Chargers, for, uh, Chargers for, for three seasons, and then I was with the Colts for a season. Now, I know playing at the Chargers, there's memories that you have there. This is around the 90 time period. Right. So in the 90s, that means you had Junior Seau there. Uh, uh, was Rodney Harrison on the defense? Rodney Harrison was there. Okay. We call him Friendly Fire. Why, why Friendly Fire? <laughs> because in practice, um, even we would just do like, a, you know, like a walkthrough where you're supposed to come up and kind of just, you know, like touch the guy off and kind of set up. He come there full speed and knock you off your feet. <laughs> I'm your teammate, bro. I got to play on Sunday. Why you? He had one, one gear, and so everybody on the team hated him. Yeah. We hated Rodney Harrison, <laughs> but we loved playing for him, playing with him on Sunday. So yeah, we call him Friendly Fire because he didn't he didn't have but one speed. So getting to the NFL, mm -hmm. getting coming to the Chargers, right? You are one of the greatest linebackers that you yeah. are looking across to now yeah. as you're lining up in the backfield, right? What was your experience? A, what was it like just being drafted? Like, right. I'm here now. I'm here. Right. And then two, I have this legend on the other end over here that I got to run against, right. you know, for him to hit me in practice. What was this experience like? So, like, once, once I signed my contract and I realized that I'm one of 
over the course of all of these years, one of five to 6,000 guys who have ever gotten a chance to play in the National Football League. That kind of overwhelmed me and that, that kind of took me over and it was just a surreal feeling. It was something that really, really allowed me to just say to myself, man, this is, this is real. But now, once I sign and I have like a little party and I like, you know, my friends are coming over and I'm like, but then it comes down to, okay, now we got to go to San Diego. And as you say it, now I'm across from Junior Seau. And very first practice, um, it was Natron Means um, was, 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 was a teammate of mine, a couple of guys. I'm sitting in very first practice and we're in a hitting drill with our linebackers. And so I see them go, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, and they, so they, so they're kind of moving back, moving back. And next thing you know, I'm up. And as I'm up, I'm like, okay, and I'm looking across and it's Junior Seau. So as I told you before, <laughs> my very first time that I went to block him, he's coming to me and I'm, I'm like, oh, this dude is huge. He's six foot three. He's 245, 250 pounds and moves like a cat. He's one of the best linebackers in the game. I go and I kind of close my eyes and I reach for him. When I reach and I look up, he's not even there. Gone, just around. He hits the quarterback, whatever, the, the, um, the dummy. Right, right. So I'm like, Steven, get back in and do it again. So June gets back. So this time I'm looking for him and I'm thinking he's gonna make a move on me. And what's he do? Runs right over me. I'm on the ground, I'm looking up. So that was my first moment of saying, maybe I'm not ready for the NFL. Gotcha. But practicing against him day in, day out, getting better, getting better. I knew that if I could block Junior, who had every trick in the book, spin move, you know, rip, overhand, if I could practice against him, I could block any linebacker in the league. That, that, that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. But that's let's it. back it up for two seconds. Okay. You said you signed, had a party. Right. At that time in the 90s, what was your signing bonus for? So signing bonus at that time wasn't really, really, really great. And for a free agent, I got probably the most of any free agent. So signing bonus at that time was like a hundred grand, which was which was which was more than enough. Yeah, that that was that was more than enough. And I know. Right now, you'd be like, yeah. but back then, bro, what? I was like, shoot. I was like, let's let's. <laughs> so did they fly you out? Did you have to pay for your own flight? Oh, no. What was that like? No, no, no. So they send the ticket and everything. So literally. I go to the airport and my ticket is waiting on me. And I fly out and when I get to the airport there, I got somebody waiting on me. I, I didn't have a car or anything like that. I did have a car, but not there. So they took me everywhere that I need to go through, you know, van or whatever. Um, and so no, once you sign, they take care of everything. Now I was talking to a football player before, NFL guy. Mm -hmm. When you was riding around in the van and all that stuff, cause you didn't have a car at the time. Right. When you got your first check, was any of that reflected of, huh, I had to pay for some rentals here? Or was everything nice and even? Like no, so, so when I got my first check from them, um, there wasn't. So they basically comped all of that. Okay. But, of course, my agent, mm -hmm. you know, he's got to get his cut. So, like, there were, there were, there were some pre- NFL pre-charger things, you know, um, 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 agent, uh, he funded me some money to get a car. He, he, you know what I'm saying? So when that check, when I got that first check, I had to pay him back for some of those things. So, but as far as like from the team, though. And before we dive into your career of an NFL football player and then jump to what we doing as your business now, let's walk the viewers through. You signed the deal, you gotta pay your agent, you gotta perform to, to right. continue to get paid. You've been watching NFL football probably your whole life. Right. What are some things that you like, man? Watching the game, I didn't know it was like this. Now that I'm in the locker room, what was the ooh eye opener? Right. Um, two things. One is it's kind of self-explanatory. The sheer speed of the game. You know, every level that you go up, <clears throat> you're in an age range. So when you play Pop Warner, if you're 10, you probably play somebody 9, 10, or 11, mm -hmm. right? High school or in, 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 
in middle school, you know what I'm saying, somebody between the ages of like 12 and 14, 12, you know what I'm saying, high school between like 15 and 18, college, you're going to play between, you know, 18 and 22. It's different when you're 22 and you're playing against a guy who's 34. See what I'm saying? He's a grown man. He's got kids. He's got a wife. He's got a mortgage. He's got things. He's got other things. He's got, this is his livelihood. This is, he's got grown man body. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm still growing into mine. He's, he, he's, the, I kind of thought about the speed of the game. I knew that it would be fast. It, and, and it still shocked me how fast, how everything happened. But being in a locker room with grown men, um, that kind of took me by surprise. I didn't realize how big guys were, how strong they were, how a guy who is six foot seven, 290 pounds can get in front of me and pull and get to the hole before I do. <laughs> how, how does that, how does that, and how this dog on defensive end who in college, you know what I'm saying, might come off the end and he might get on the backside of the play, can get to that hole before you even do. So the sheer speed, size, and that grown man aspect of it was like the biggest eye opener for me that I'm about to get my body right. Really. This is not going to be an easy trip for me at all. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, your same study habits that you had in high school, the same study habits mentally that you had in uh, college, right. how was that in the NFL? What kind of approach did you take? You will not play pro football if you're an idiot. Come on. Let me, let me, let me, let me preach one time. The study habits that you are creating, not only on the field, but like in school, um, all of those times that you are, you know, doing homework, those same study habits that you are putting into your schoolwork and all that stuff, that is going to have to apply to what you're doing on the field. You, the day of the dumb athlete, the day of the dumb jock, the day of, you know, the guy who can just kind of get by on just his athletic ability alone, those days are done. You have got to study. And by study, I mean you have got to do all the things that it takes to make sure that you know your opponent as well as you can possibly know him. Because now you're at the highest level where everybody on that team is good from one to number 52. Everybody's good. Everybody. Every single last kid. What separates yourself is noticing their tendencies and playing off of those tendencies. So you will not play. Listen to what I'm saying. You will not play pro football if you're an idiot. Won't do it. You won't do it. It won't happen. You can be six foot three, 242 pounds, run a 416, catch everything. Mess around and run the wrong route because you don't know what you're doing. They're going to cut you. Come on. Because you ain't been studying. You ain't been studying. How, how thick is that playbook, though? Oh, man. <laughs> I tell that story, too. My coach handed me a book, and it was that thick. And he said, we got to learn this by Wednesday. I'm like, but it's Saturday. One, two, three, that's four days. I cannot tell you, and Natron can attest to this. They put us up in a hotel, um, but I hardly ever stayed at the hotel. I became friends with Natron, although he's a Tar Heel, which, you know, <laughs> we can all, all be great. We can all be, some of us got to go on the mediocre side. But um, I stayed at his house more so than I stayed at the hotel. And I became his little brother. And I know that I annoyed him to death, but I kept asking him questions. Because again, I'm trying to learn. I'm like, like Nate, like, you know, what, what is, if the linebacker, if, if the middle blitzes and he gets picked up, but the, weak, but, the, but the Sam comes, learning that stuff from him. Find somebody who can be a mentor for you. He was that for me. And I do realize that one of the reasons why I made that team, not because I was the best running back, not because I caught the ball better than the backs, because when it came to blitz pickup, this quarterback, mm -hmm. I'm, making, I'm making, you know, a million, 1.5. He making 20. Who are you going to cut first? Come on. If, if that linebacker gets to him, I'm the first one gone. So me knowing how to pick up blitzes and me being willing to pick up blitzes is what helped me to. Uh, so, 
to make that spot. As you made the team with the Chargers, who was one of the top defenders that you said, man, that's that guy that you had to go against on Sundays when, when the ball went up? When I say this team, you're going to know exactly who it is. We were playing the Baltimore Ravens, and um, obviously it was Ray Lewis. Um, we had a, a, a play design to where if he blitzed, then I had to pick him up. Uh, but if he doesn't, then I was going to run um, a little wheel route based out out to the side. And so I saw Ray go with our halfback, so he wasn't blitzing. So I said, yes, that's one less headache for me. I'm going to go out here to this wheel route. And uh, my quarterback was Ron Leaf. So I think it kind of laid you a little bit more of, of uh, so it was a bad pass. I had to turn around to catch the ball to the line of scrimmage. So when I turned back around, everything went black and all that I heard was, uh, was barking. And that's it. And so what I found out was, again, to kind of show y'all that studying helps you out tremendously is that um, Ray has studied and kind of seen, is that good? Okay, Ray, Ray has studied and kind of seen that, hey, when the halfback goes out in the flats, the running back's gonna run a wheel route. So he baited me, came back, knocked me out. By the time I woke up, I was in the locker room. So not a good day. Ray Lewis is, first of all, Ray, you're wrong for that. You should have told me you was coming. And then secondly, I need you to have me barking like that. That was, that was not good. <laughs> so we do four years mm -hmm. uh, NFL total. You right. do three with Chargers and one with Indianapolis. Um, now, was that a young Peyton Manning that you played with, or was that like a more seasoned Peyton Manning? It was, it was both. We were both drafted in the, same, in the same class in 98. So that was his fourth season. That was my fourth season. Um, I literally took a flight from in San Diego to Indy. I got off the flight. I had somebody who... They met me there again, my car wasn't there or anything. The first place they took me was over to the facility for like my first practice. Like literally, I would come from the plane to practice. As I'm walking into the spot, um, Peyton is walking past me and I'm thinking he doesn't know anything about me and, 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 and doesn't know who I am. He says, hey Tremaine, man, it's good to have you, man. I'm glad to have you here. You know, I look forward to playing with you. Peyton took the time to see who was coming in, who was coming out make sure that he endeared himself to that player, which made me say, hey, man, that's my quarterback. I'm going to make sure that I block for him. So Peyton Manning, to me, is an all-time great, not just for what he does on the field, but also what he does, you know, off the field as well. At the same breath, was Adrian James there at that time? Or was this? Adrian James was, <laughs> Adrian James was there. And again, he was another guy who took me in. You know, I spent some nights at Adrian's house, um, got a chance to meet Trina, which was at the height of her, yeah, so that was, that was kind of sweet, you know what I'm saying? He's a Miami dude, you know, I rode around with him and his Rolls Royce that had fur, fur on the, on the, uh, <laughs> on the boy. I, I had to take my shoes off, put the fur, and roll. I mean, it was, it was really good. But yeah, Edge was there, another great running back. I had a chance to play behind some really, really great running backs. Natro Mean, dog, Adrian James, stuff like that, man. So, um, and another guy who was a mentor as well, although he was only maybe a year or two older than me. Um, but still, you know, obviously a great running back, but a great mentor too. So the NFL gave you four great ones. Right. Now you leave the NFL, now you just Tremaine. Now you got a vision and a dream with fitness. Right. What made you start your business that you're currently doing today? Well, I think that what a lot of people kind of get wrapped up in is saying, I'm Tremaine Stevens, or I'm so-and-so, the football player. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you're kind of setting yourself up for a little bit of failure. Because at some point in time, even if you have a 19, 20-year career, mm -hmm. you will not be a football player. True. So I, I never really saw myself as Tremaine Stevens, the football player. I saw myself as a Tremaine Stevens who plays football. So once I got done playing and once I got done doing my thing, I wasn't one of those guys that was like, oh, man, I'm done. Like, what am I doing now? Like, no, I already had my plan in place. I knew that I wanted to do something that was dealing in sports. I knew that I wanted to do something that was dealing with kids. And I knew that I wanted to do something that dealt with health and helping people to stay not only healthy from a physical standpoint, but from a mental standpoint as well. So I first went into um, to Parks and Recreation. So that kind of helped me out. I, I worked at some rec centers here in Gastonia, North Carolina. Um, but then as that started to go on, I realized that I had more in me. 
And so that's when I started my own business. And I basically started from two clients. We were training outside and um, uh, we were just getting in. And from there, my name kind of grew in the area. Um, I had my first building was about a thousand square feet. But to me, that was more than that was like huge. Um, it grew. My next business was, was about 7,000 square feet. Um, that grew over the course of two years. My next building was about 15,000 square feet, which I thought that it would never get bigger than that. Um, but within a year, I had outgrown that. And now my current business right now, we're at 55,000 square feet. And we've got everything from soccer to baseball to basketball to wrestling to men's and women's sports to men's and women's training, all those things all under one roof. And it's just fun because I get a chance to fulfill my dream of helping others be healthier, helping others to be better, while at the same time having a chance to really kind of showcase my skills as well. And the name of it is called ADS. Where did that come from? Where did you, why did you pick that name at all names? Well, when I first started this thing, I wasn't even thinking about men and women training. I wasn't thinking about, really, I wasn't even thinking about other sports. I was thinking about football only. Athletic Development Systems. I wanted to get these athletes. I wanted to bring them in. I wanted to help them to get better, to develop, and then just your system is just the, 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 the system that I personally have, which starts off with you know love. You got to make sure you show these guys that you love them. B, you got to be tough on them. C, you got to show them that you are ready to like help them to grow it any way possible. And then you just want to make sure that you know you give them every single chance to do everything that you did and more. So that's my system. So I want to take these athletes, get them, give them my system. So I came up with that. I kept that, although over the course of time, it evolved into, okay, wow, I'm going to start training girls softball. I'm going to start training because I realized training is universal. You know what I'm saying? Footwork is kind of universal. So I started training golf sports, and then it's just like an evolution of, I had a parent who asked me, hey, well, do you train women? Well, oh, no, I don't, but I can start, and I'm going to start with you. Let's go. And from that, now I have over 100 online clients. I've got over 30 clients that are here in person. Um, so it kind of gives me that chance to kind of evolve, and it's, and it's still evolving. I do football camps. Um, I do all kind of things, so it's just... It's fun for me. Every single day that I wake up, I'm blessed. So when people come to ADS, mm -hmm. what type of training are they getting you and your staff? Again, first and foremost, um, they're getting trainers who care. They're getting trainers who care about them. They're getting trainers who care about what they do. They are getting trainers who care about who they are. Um, everything that we do is for the benefit of others. If you're a trainer that's looking for like self-fulfillment, you probably don't need to be a trainer. Um, this is a service industry. This is an industry where we are giving to others. I give of my expertise because I want to help you to live a little bit longer to play with your kids, to play with your grandkids, to play with your... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that is what we do. Um, and then for our athletes, we want to give them the nuggets that we have, like the mentor that my dad was to me, that's what we get a chance to be to these athletes. So everything that we do is geared towards the people that we are working with. We want to try to help them to be the best they can possibly be. And before we let you get out of here, mm -hmm. um, where can the people find you? Where are you on social media? If people want to say, man, I got to get my child in there or I got to get myself in there, right? you know, me speaking myself, right. uh, where can we find you at? Um, if you want to go to my website, my website is www.stevenspeed.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S -E and then S-P-E-E-D.com. Um, my Instagram, which I would love for you to follow me on, my Instagram, it is T-R-E-M-A-Y-N-E dot Stevens dot fit. So it's Tremaine dot Stevens dot fit. Um, and then on Facebook, it's, uh, it's Tremaine Stevens on, uh, on Facebook. 
Well, man, we appreciate you coming by Grand Dossier TV today or letting us come to you today uh, to give your knowledge of the game, your knowledge of living healthy, because everybody know your health is your real wealth. It is. So, therefore, we appreciate you, man. And everybody that's listening, make sure you subscribe, like, hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date to any new videos that we put up. And we'd like to say thank you one more time to my man, Jermaine. Appreciate it. And very quickly, man, if you're not rocking with Grand Dossier TV, you're missing out. Come on, let's go.